Okay, we're here uh, this morning with Dr. Bentley Schellerhammer in his home in Tallahassee, and we're going to have a little chat about his life and career. All right. <laughs> so, uh, to start off, um, you know, why did you decide to become a band director? Were there specific circumstances that led you there, or, you know, how did you, what, what brought you to that career? Well, I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, and um, I was in fourth grade, and our elementary school had an elementary school band, and the band director sent home a letter, uh, ditto, with hand-drawn pictures of the instruments and, you know, a recruiting letter. And nobody in my family had ever been involved in music, but my mother loved music, and so she encouraged me to join the band. Really? Nobody in your family was in music? Nobody ever. And you hadn't taken any music lessons before that? No. Yeah. No. But I loved music in school. I mean, I loved elementary music. Yeah. So um, I joined the band, and it was a really, really positive experience. Um, and my mother in insisted that I take private lessons after I started the saxophone. And so she signed me up for lessons at the local music store. And I had a really good teacher. He was very encouraging. And, and I did well. And then we moved to Florida when I was in seventh grade. And um, I had um, three different band directors in junior high school, one, a different one each year. But the one in the eighth grade, his name was Mr. Windsor, he probably is the first real influence on me wanting to become a band director because he was so he was so nice and positive and generous and kind and um, he was just the, the perfect teacher and then when I went to high school I had um, one of the notorious band directors of the time this was back in the 60s early no, late late 50s um, with all the stories we hear about FBA, the meetings going until midnight and into the wee hours of the morning. Well, that was my high school band director was one of those rebel rousers. His name was Bob Alexander. And um, it was North Miami High School. I grew up in Miami, yeah. And um, we had a really good band, but he was not a very good band director. Um, he was a really good man. I mean, I really liked him, and he was. All the kids liked him, but he wasn't the best musician, but we had a good band anyway. Um, and so I sort of half-kiddingly said that um, I wanted to become a band director so that I could prove that that's not the way you did it. And I was sort of half, I was half serious and half not. But I think really that my eighth grade band director is the one that got me started on the course and by the time I was a junior in high school, I was sure that's what I wanted to do. I was the drum major, and I was the student conductor, so I had a lot of encouragement. Was he encouraging of you? Yes, yeah. very much so. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you knew by the end of high school that this is the career path for you, then what was the next step? Well, the next step was getting influenced of where to go to college. Um, I had my my mindset on going away up north um, to sort of an Ivy League type school because I, I did I did really well in school. Um, and then in my senior year, the FSU Marching Chiefs came to Miami to play the University of Miami, and I went to the game and I went, oh my God, I can't believe it. that's a marching band. I mean, the sound, the music. It's just awesome. And so I started to think about FSU. I never even heard of FSU before that. And then they came down in the springtime, they came on tour, concert tour. Mm -hmm. And I went to their concert. And that did. That sold it up right there. And decided FSU is where I'm going. So, so uh, what was your time like in Tallahassee? And, you know, what were those? college years like, <laughs> learning how to be a band director, and who were the influences that you know, kind of pushed you along the way in yeah. FSU? Well, FSU got me really started, you know, they, 
the undergraduate program was, was really well, well balanced. Um, one of my main mentors during those years was Manny Whitcomb. And um, he was the director of bands the whole time I was an undergraduate. He did the marching band my first year. And um, then I had to drop out of school. My mother died during my the end of my freshman year wow. that summer. She, she died. And I had to stay home to help my dad. Um, and um, when I came back, um, Robert Brownable was the director of the marching band. How long about Just a semester. Yeah. Um, so Robert Brownagle was the director of the marching band, but Manley Whitcomb was still the director of the band. And so those two guys really provided me with lots of encouragement and mentorship. Um, the college was good. I mean, it was, I was a serious student. So I didn't I didn't play around too much. <laughs> I got a lot done. Yeah. So uh, you leave that this year, and where did you land at first? What was your my, teaching position? Well, I interned. I did my internship here in Tallahassee because I was married. I got married at the end of my sophomore year. Wow. And um, so I was allowed to stay here in Tallahassee, and I interned at Rickards High School. Hmm. And at that time, there were only two public high schools in town. Um, there was Leon and there was Rickards. And Rickards was a junior senior high, it was 7 through 12. And while I was interning there, they offered me the job. My, my supervising teacher decided he was going to go back to FSU and get his doctorate in education. So they offered me the job, and since I already knew the students and everything, I figured, yes, this is a great opportunity. Yeah. So we stayed here and I took that, that job. Um, the principal told me when he hired me that if I did a good job, he would hire me an assistant for the second year to help me with the junior high. Because I had um, I had about 80 in the junior high band and about 75 or 80 in the high school band. And I was running beginning band through symphonic band. And so he did. He kept his promise. In the second year, he allowed me to hire an assistant. And then the third year, um, I hired Bob Spradlin, who was getting his master's at FSU. And it was a part-time position, half-time. Yeah. But Bob took over the junior high program for me. And I was at Rickards for five years, and we did some really good things there. We had to educate Tallahassee that there was another band in town. It wasn't just Leon. <laughs> but um, Oliver Hobbs was at Leon at that time, and um, he had hired Lewis Jones that year when I first took the Rickards job. They worked together. And um, Jeff Bradford mm -hmm. was at Gandhi. And um, so I had three really important mentors there during the, those periods that helped me out. It's uh, it's fascinating to me that you know I mean all the names that you're naming obviously this is you know this is the major history of of our of our state mm -hmm. band and you, know, you were around all of them. What was that? What was that like? I mean, that was been in their heyday. It was amazing. Yeah. Um, most of the guys that I mean Tom Bishop and, and guys like that I didn't know personally, mm -hmm. but I used to observe them. And, and that's how I really learned what to do. The only the only person that ever that ever took um, a teaching role with me that said, "Now this is how you need to do this," then <laughs> was Oliver Hobbs. Yeah. Um, he would put his arm on my shoulder and say, "Now you know that's not really the way the way that's supposed to go. This is the way it's supposed to go." The other people were were mentors in the form of they set examples for me and. Um, so Jeff and, and Lewis and some other folks in my early years really provided examples of, of what I should be listening for and what but I should be doing. But at that time in your early career, Oliver was the most Oliver was the most influential. Yes, yeah. as far as the band business goes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, 
So after that period of time, what was the impetus to leave, and where did you go from there? Well, the impetus was Bob Spradlin again. Um, he left during my fourth, at the end of my fourth year at Rickards, he left and went to um, Broward County, and he took Deerfield Beach Junior High. And um, so he was there for a whole year during my fifth year at Rickards. And at the end of the year, he called me, and he said, you know, he said, they're building five new high schools down here. They're all going to open next year. And I've already five high schools at one time? Five years, yeah, five high schools in one year, and they'd already opened two the year before, the, that year, that he was calling me. So there were seven new high schools in two years. And he said, um, I've already picked the one I want. <laughs> and he knew the principal and everything, so it was a done deal. He said, but the next one, the next best one, with the best principal, is going to be Piper. And um, he said, um, my mother knows knows him, and we can set up an interview for you if, if you'll come down and, and look at the job. So I did. I went down and interviewed for the job. Uh, the school wasn't even half completed yet, the building. And I interviewed at his house, and he said, um, I'm hiring the two most important people in the school program um, this summer. He said, I'm hiring the athletic director and I'm hiring the band director. And right then I knew that's the man I wanted to work with. Right, you don't hear that all the time. That's right. And um, he offered me the job right on the spot. I was the only person he interviewed. And um, so my wife and I got in the car and we drove out to Piper to see where it was. And it was in... <laughs> You wouldn't believe it. It was in the middle of a cow pasture. And um, the road ended about a half a mile away from the school. And you had to drive on a dirt road. And then you went through a pasture fence and across this field to get to the school. And I got out and wandered around a little bit to see how things were laid out. You know, so, But that's how I wound up at Piper. And so what was that experience like? How long were you there? And what were the, you know... Well, that that was... I was there six years. And that was the major challenge in my career. I've had a very charmed career, I guess. And um, But that was a major challenge. Um, the school was created to relieve extreme pressure from other schools. And so... Piper, the kids that were assigned to go to Piper were from five different schools. And none of those kids wanted to go to that school. None of them. Um, the second challenge was I only had one f middle school that was to feed Piper. And the band program there was practically non-existent. I mean, the first three or four years I was at Piper, I, the most kids I ever got from that middle school was 11. That was the most. Um, so I knew I had I had to do something. So I started a beginning band, a ninth grade beginning band, my very first year there. And I figured, well, if I'm out to get kids in, I better grow them. Right. And um, and I did, and I got some really good students from that. So you mean to say I'm going to be a little snarky when I ask this? Instead of you know bemoaning the circumstances, you actually try to solve the problem. Right. This is exactly. what it is. I'm to make it work. That's right. <laughs> exactly right. Because the, the middle school wasn't going to get fixed. Yeah. I knew that. The other thing that saved our program at Piper was a huge influx of students from Long Island. Really? So my, my, my theater program for the first five or six years, actually the whole time I was there, was Long Island. What was that connection? Well, um, Piper was located in a city called Sunrise, which was an infant, just the beginning of it. It's a huge city now. And Piper is now in the center of Broward County. But at that time, it was in the far western outreaches. But Sunrise was bu being built up all around Piper. And all these New Yorkers were retiring, or they were, they were leaving the north to come down. And, and I just had this steady stream of students moving in from Long Island. It must have been a very diverse population. It was. It was very diverse.
And um, coming from a rural type city up here, you know, mostly um, country oriented, right. southern. To go down to that type of environment was was quite a difference, yeah. but um, that was the that was the major challenge was was to get the thing going, and and we did we we got it going really well. Um, my third year, the principal hired me as assistant. We started an orchestra, and that was Richard Rogers, and he left after a year, and then I hired Cindy Berry, smartest thing I ever did. <laughs> She and I worked together for two years, and then she took over. So when you left, she inherited the program. Right. Mm -hmm. So what happened next? Tell us the next chapter of the story. Well, I was perfectly happy at Piper. I was, um, like I said, we were building the program and getting it going. And uh, um, I came up, they invited me to come up and teach the summer band camp here at FSU that year. And... Um, while I was here, they decided to fire the the man that they hired to take the marching chiefs. Um, it was a disastrous year for, for FSU that year. So they, they decided to fire him while I was up here teaching the music camp. And um, Bob Brownagle encouraged me to apply. So the last day I was here, I sort of half-heartedly wrote out a hand handwritten application letter and left him on his desk and went home. And um, Cindy had been teaching my summer band program um, for me. And so I went home and started teaching summer band again. And um, early July, I got a call from the, the dean up here saying that I was one of the finest. Wow. They wanted me to come up for an interview and wanted me to conduct the band. And I did. I came up and I did that. and. When I figured well, nothing's going to happen. Um, I went home, and about a week later, they called me and offered me the job. So it was the end of July when I got hired. Wow. And um, I had to be up here by the second week in August. So I had I only had like two or three weeks to get ready. I mean, move my family and, and everything and get ready for the football season. FSU was on the quarter system at that time, and um, football actually started before school started. So we had to bring in all the marching chiefs like two or three weeks before school started, house them, feed them, train them, get ready for the first game, and uh, it was <laughs> it was a challenge. How old were you at this point? I was 32. So, um, what was that? I mean, you didn't have a whole lot of time probably to, to think about it. You just had to do. I had to design a show and yeah. teach a show and, and get Charlie to write music. And I've never done that before. Right. Now, I, 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 I had been using sort of an FSU type model for my high school marching band. So, I, I was familiar with all that. Sure. But I'd never done it full big time like had an arranger, my God. How do you work with an arranger? And how do you get all that stuff out to the kids? And I mean, it was it was a steep learning curve, <laughs> but it went really well. It was great. And the kids were so happy to have somebody back that was that knew what the FSU Marching Chiefs was all about. The guy that they hired for one year, this, uh, he he made the classic mistake of changing everything at once, took away all the traditions. He was a heavy, heavy, heavy core style guy from Louisiana, and he wanted to turn the marching chiefs into a core style marching band, competitive type. And boy, that just didn't go over. <laughs> so I had it easy. Yeah. They were so happy I was here that I didn't have much, much negative stuff going on at all. How many years? You were in front of the chief from at that from that point forward. I did twelve twelve years with the chiefs, wow. and um, I did the marching chiefs. I did the jazz band, the second jazz band for a couple of years. I taught music ed, and I taught and I conducted the concert band during those twelve years. And after 
last 12 years? Well, um, they had sort of pegged me, <laughs> unbeknownst to me, they had lined me up in their minds to become one of the assistant deans. And um, the assistant dean for operations was retiring soon. They knew that. And so they sort of just um, made it impossible for me to say no. <laughs> and uh, so I moved into administration, but with the stipulation that I still would have a band and I would still be able to teach. So, so what, were, what were some of the challenges that you experienced in going from high school program to a college program? Challenges? Yeah. There were no challenges. It's a pretty <laughs> smooth transition. Yeah, it was pretty smooth. The, the one big thing, and people probably, well, my former students would believe me. Um, when I was a high school band director, I was, I was in the mode of the time, which was extremely negative, extremely demanding, um, Bill Rivelli type operation. Um, all through my high school career, I was that way. Very demanding and very, just to be this way, and very, very little positive. And I don't know what, well, I do know what happened, but the first day I stood in front of the marching chiefs, I was 100% positive and I never changed. Wow. Rarely was I negative. The people who didn't know you then, that I know, was they, would, they would say, what, what this isn't Benny Sean. Yeah. But, um, now I still had the same expectations and I still had the same demands of, of the group, but I just, I just something in my brain clicked and said, you know, if I'm if I'm an SOB with these guys like I was with my high school, they're not going they're not going to put up with it. Yeah. I mean, some of them were almost as old as I was, okay. and um, and so I just became I became positive, and and you know what? It's a whole lot better way to live. Yeah. It's a whole lot better. So I I really never had any. You know, you had your minor run-ins and things sure. to deal with, but nothing, hmm. nothing so bad. Um, in that whole time, you know, the ups and downs and all the things that go into a, a career in music. I mean, what were the things that helped keep, helped to keep you growing, keep your edge, you know, keep you? focused and moving forward despite whatever comes along but related to music what were the things that helped you to kind of keep your keep your edge in music and music yeah. it was always the music there was always a piece that I discovered <laughs> that I hadn't heard before that got me excited and, I, and I'd say someday I want to do that piece someday I want my band to be good enough to do that piece when I was teaching high school, it was that way. There was always, there was always something music. There was always a piece of music that I wanted my band to get good enough to be able to play, and it would just keep going that way. When I was in, when I did college, it was the same thing. I would go to CB, CBDNA and hear a group do a new piece, and um, I'd go, "Wow, I'd like to do that piece." And then it became, it became an issue of not not worrying about the band being able to play it, but worrying about whether or not I could, you know, you get to a certain level in music that it's not whether or not the ensemble can play it, it's whether or not you can make sense out of it enough to teach it to them and get it to sound the way it's supposed to sound. And the other thing that has always kept me going are my friends, my colleagues, that I have a deep personal respect for. Um, when I was early in my career, it was Oliver Hobbs, and it was Jeff Bradford, and it was Lewis Jones. And later in my career, it was Dwayne Hendon and Bob Spradley. And then at FSU, it was Manly Whitcomb. Um, but the one person that had the most influence in my whole life has been Cliff Matson. I don't 
lot of band directors don't know Cliff because he's not a band director, right. but he's the music ed professor at FSU, and he's influenced my life so deeply through the years in all aspects. Give us an example of something that sticks out in your mind that was really impactful from him. Um, well, a lot of it's personal, so I'm not going to go there. Um, his whole his whole um, career is based on teaching positive reinforcement, and I said when I was a high school band director, I was 100% negative, but I knew what I was supposed to do <laughs> because of what he taught, and. And because he gave me such a thorough understanding of all that, um, when it came time for me to do that, it was easy. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he's been at FSU 52 years. Wow. And he's still teaching. He's still the same schedule. He doesn't, he hasn't slacked off one bit. He's an amazing man. One of the most intelligent men I've ever known. So. Um, I have uh, two questions uh, for you now that you're at this stage of your life. Um, the first is, you know, how do you remain connected um, to music and to the profession now that you're in retirement? Um, we'll start there, and then I'll okay. answer the next question. Um, well, up until last year, um, I still had my Tallahassee wins, so I was still actively involved in conducting and um, but I did retire from that group um, two years ago um, now my main uh, contact with music and all is through the FBA mm -hmm. judging um, doing some clinics uh, rehearsal clinics and um, running the state solo and ensemble festival right. so probably gives you a being on that side of things probably gives you a vastly different perspective mm -hmm. uh, than when you were in it, you know, as yeah. a teacher, as a professor. Right. Um, you are often um, asked to present clinics about uh, professional ethics. Mm -hmm. So obviously this is an area that you are respected for. Um, and uh, as a band director, I know that you are highly respected for your professionalism. Um, so um, I, I don't really have a question here. I just want to kind of open open up a little bit for you to talk about you know your view about that because obviously we call on you often to to speak about professionalism. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know what is it about that subject? Um, you know, other than the fact that you've always modeled that. But, you know, like I said, we ask you often to speak on it. Mm -hmm. Well, professionalism in regards to music education, being a band director, hinges around my, my philosophy is that being a band director, a band teacher, is not a job. It's a, it's a profession. And just as a doctor um, can never leave that profession. I mean, he's on call 24 hours a day. The demands of the job take precedence over everything. That's the way I think band directors, successful band directors, approach um, being a, a music educator. Um, you have to be willing to sacrifice family time, financial support, or financial comfort, and personal time in order to succeed. And if you have that as, if you have that notion in your mind that it's a profession, it's not a job, and yeah, I'm going to have to give up some weekends, and I'm going to have to give up a lot of evenings, and I'm going to have to go to school early in the morning, and once you have that in your mind, then things line up pretty well. Um, the other thing is, is just adopting a code of for yourself, a code of responsibility, self-responsibility, in regards to students. Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm from the old school, and we didn't have cell phones, and we didn't have texting, and we didn't have emails. But if I were teaching nowadays, I can guarantee you, I would not be on the cell phone or on emails with my students. I just wouldn't. It's dangerous. It's a very narrow line. It's a very, very narrow line, which gets into gray area real fast and then before you know it you're in trouble and um, so you have to know what limits are and, and uh, but the main focus I think is, is accepting the role of a professional rather than just as a job being a teacher isn't a job you know, if you want a job, you become a bricklayer or a plumber, which is fine. There's a wonderful, wonderful careers. But if you want to be a teacher, you better be a professional. So, I said I had two uh, questions for you about your retirement. So, um, this will be kind of our, our, our final wrap-up question. Okay. Um, so, uh, again, standing on this Side and kind of looking across the state and interacting with young band directors and um, and um, dealing with them in the administrative side of solo and ensemble and so forth. Um, you probably have thoughts about advice, you know. And it's I'm sure it's hard because there are just some cultural things that have changed over time. Mm -hmm. And you know we we're trying to help young directors be successful with their mindset. Mm -hmm. But, you know, what's your, other than the professionals of which we just talked about, what are the things that you, the advice that you would impart to a young director who's watching you, um, you know, especially as it relates to your experience in dealing with, you know, directors today? Um, well, my advice would be to really think hard about expectations. Because your program is going to be based on on what you allow the students to do. If you allow them to play out of tune, they're going to play out of tune. If you expect them to play in tune, if that's your expectation, they're going to play in tune. Now, you're going to have to sometimes work out ways to get there. And that's when you invite in people that know how to do it uh, to serve as, as models for you. But without expectations, nothing's going to happen in your program. Um, it's not going to grow. It's not going to get better. So you have to have a, a, a list of expectations. What do you what do you expect your students to be able to do? And and I would do that on a yearly basis. I would sit down before the, the next school year starts and say, All right, now this year I expect this to happen. I expect this to happen. I expect this to happen. That way, you you have a goal, you have a you have direction. Um, if you just go in and say, "Well, we'll see how things go this year," and pick your music and and just go, you know. Um, when I was teaching at Piper, I had I had as one of my dream pieces that I wanted to work on was Jericho. At that time, was played a lot. Yeah. And um, I dreamed about, well, one day I'd like my band to be good enough to be able to play Jericho. And then one year it became an expectation. I said, next year we're going to play Jericho. That's what I expect of you. And so we read it down the year before. We read it a couple of times. We put it away. And then the next year I expected them to play it. And they did. So... Um, Young guys sometimes don't sit down and, and think about what they what they expect from from a band. And um, the better the program gets, the more expectations you can have. Um, but you have to stay there. You have to stay at a, at a at a particular position long enough so that your expectations can be achieved. And once you, once you start achieving some of your expectations. They become built into the program. They become automatic. You don't have to keep addressing those issues. You lay down the next level of expectations, and then the next level, and the next level. And that's how strong programs get built. 
So that's my advice. Is think about what you expect. Don't just accept anything. Uh, Dr. Kelly, you know, you've been um, an influence on thousands and thousands of students and band directors, probably some who you don't even know you were influential to me in the early stages of my career and on. And uh, so from me and from all of those people, of course, we thank you for all of your, uh, your not just your influence, but your modeling and um, your help and guidance and um, and for your influence on the SBA all of these years and continuing to have an influence on the SBA. And so uh, we thank you uh, for, you know, um, and appreciate just a tremendous career in, uh, in Florida. And thank you for your time this morning. Thank you for those kind of words. You're welcome. It's been fun. <laughs>